Okay. Um, Rowan, thanks so much for uh, your time this afternoon. Um, we have uh, Dr. Rowan Williams with us uh, today on our short uh, series. It's not a lecture, just a thought. And uh, just before we uh, started recording, um, I mentioned to uh, Rowan that uh, I'd like to ask him maybe just to introduce for us very briefly um, his uh, contribution to the understanding of orthodoxy as dialogue. Well, it's a, it's a big question, really, but um, I suppose what, what's been in my mind is that the orthodoxy of the church as it developed, developed in the context of exchange and argument. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something that happened all at once. And part of what's happening in the early church, as people move towards doctrinal definition, is to try and keep as many things as possible in play in the conversation. So when a, a view is rejected as a heresy, very often it's not just, oh, that's a mistake. Yeah. It's uh, actually that narrows the scope of what we're talking about. Okay. So George Lindbeck, in his famous book on the major doctrine, says that it's something to do with the impostors. Say as much as you can about Jesus Christ, for example, with the doctrines of the creed and the uh, Council of Chalcedon. So if somebody says, well, I'm not too sure about Jesus being completely divine or completely human, the response is, but we need to keep as much as possible in the conversation. So that's one aspect of the, the dialogue thing. It means that in those early Christian arguments and later Christian arguments, orthodoxy is something you haven't yet quite mastered, but the, the dialogue, the conversation, even sometimes the confrontation of that issue, mm. will draw out what you didn't really know you yet believed. Mm. It draws out the implications. So that's something which I I would hold to as an alternative to thinking of orthodoxy simply as something which is fixed once for all, something which descends from heaven, mm. rather something which is a continuing process of exchange, exploration, within boundaries, you know, not that anything counts. But those boundaries are there to make sure not that things kept as narrow as they can, but things kept as broad as they can. Mm. And Rowan, am I correct that um, one of the aspects or one of the ways in which you uh, frame this dialogue mm -hmm. is particularly within the Christian sacramental tradition? Very much so. What unifies the church through the ages is not people subscribing to one set of propositions, mm. but people sharing one practice. And that practice is baptism and the Eucharist and reading of scripture in the context of those events. Um, the succession of bishops in the early church is not just a matter of uh, some kind of authoritarian system, but a matter of continuous recognizing of teaching. And that means that what's going on is always implicitly or explicitly tested against the nature of the worship community. Mm. Does this kind of language actually do justice to what we say in church? Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Now, this is a very interesting area for me, and one of the areas in which uh, my students and I have been working is a, a, a sort of um, dialogue, uh, you know, to use uh, the term we've been speaking about around the nature of what it means to be church. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the interesting conversations we've been having is that, uh, you know, because the church uh, exists not as a place or a time, primarily, um, we remain church even when we are not gathered. Yes. And particularly in light of this yes. particular conference, uh, public theology conference, I wonder if you could reflect, what do you think the, the nature of the church is in this mm. framework um, when it's not gathered primarily as a worshiping mm. community? What is the role of, of the Christian individual or the Christian in society? If you look at what St. Paul says about the Christian community in the New Testament, it's quite clear that what makes the church the church is a network of relationships between human agents mm -hmm. whose centre and animating principle is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. A network of relationships whose centre and animating principle is Jesus Christ. So that comes to the surface explicitly, visibly, when we gather for worship. But the relationships continue. And the nature of those relationships is such that when I understand fully my gifts from God, mm. I understand what I've got to give to my neighbor. Mm. And then they understand likewise. So there's a real reciprocity in those relationships. There's a, com a commitment to the idea that for me to live means for me to let my neighbor live. Mm. 
And I think that's where Christian ethics really begins, and the strong sense of building up the body, as St. Paul would say. So the role of the individual agent in this is not to be pursuing their own, their own goals, it's to be asking, how can what I have be turned into the life of my neighbor? Mm. How can the humanity that I've been given the grace to enjoy become a source of life and liberation for my neighbor? And in that context, sin is the holding back of the gift that I should be using for my neighbor's life and welfare. Mm. So I think, I think often there of um, the words ascribed to St. Anthony, the patriarch of, of the Western monks, um, your life and your death is with your neighbor. Mm. In other words, for you to live and for you to die is a matter of defense for all of you. Yeah, yeah. I hear echoes in that of uh, John de Grouchy, the friend who uh, very kindly um, uh, invited you to, uh, or uh, asked you to be with us here at the, at the conference, and particularly his emphasis uh, most recently on Christian humanism, but also the, the influence of Dietrich Bonhoeffer in terms yes. of Bonhoeffer's ethics. Well, I've, I've been working also on Bonhoeffer's ethics in yeah. recent, recent months, and the notions of representation and responsibility, which are at the heart of his fragments on the ethics, mm -hmm. the fragments of the ethics book he planned, those are all of them deeply rooted in his sense of what needs to be said about Christ. Mm -hmm. Christ who represents us, Christ who is responsible for us. And if we live in Christ, then taking responsibility for the other, standing in with the other, standing with the other, mm -hmm. these all become the way in which we make Christ visible as well. Mm -hmm. Now, second to last question, um, the, the theme of this particular Global Network for Public Theology uh, co consultation has been uh, democracy, and justice mm. in global and local mm. context. Um, one of the things that strikes me about the conversation we are having now is that um, in some senses it is uh, focused on the ecclesia, the church, it's focused on Christian faith, but what does this mean in a, in a global world where Christianity is not the only religion, where some of the issues of justice and democracy that we face uh, in some senses operate outside of our primary sphere of influence? What the theological tradition says is not that the life of the church is isolated from the life of the rest of the human family, but the life of the church displays what, what God believes is possible for the human family. Mm. So in that sense, mm. the church is, as people have often said, the, the eschatological sign, the sign of what the end time might be. Mm. Look at this community. Here is a community in which people are learning to live for each other's welfare. Here's a community where the things of this world are used to signify the grace of God, not the triumph of human will. Mm. Here's a community in which the least and the most powerless is regarded as having exactly the same weight and dignity and, and worth mm. as anyone else. And that's the kind of community that, that God made human beings for. So when the church engages with the world, it doesn't simply bring a social program or a set of individual moral demands. It says, look at this, look at the way this community works as community. Mm. That's what we believe human liberation and human maturity finally looked like. And our job with the society around us is to persuade you, that society, that this is a possible and worthwhile aspiration. We do it because we know it's been made real. Mm. In the community of the risen Christ. You may or may not think that, but well, what you do, can you see that this is a form of common life that is preeminently worth living? Mm. If so, we can talk. If so, we can work together. Mm. Now, that doesn't, I think, immediately um, rule out, by no means rules out, collaboration with people of our faith or people of no particular faith. It simply says, this is what we bring to the table. Mm. The conviction that the human, human connectedness, human community, has been radically changed, re-established, re-funded, re-grounded mm. in the risen Christ. Mm. Mm. It's very interesting, uh, this particular aspect um, here in South Africa mm. has been you know, very strongly uh, captured in notions of African intersubjective yes, identity yes. and yeah, which in some senses you know it's it's an ideal rather mm -hmm. than a reality. But um, there is something about that which we are finding in African Christianity, mm -hmm. which is a, an aspirational 
aspect and a witness of our faith. Yes. No, I think for us in, in the Northern Hemisphere, that's been quite a powerful presence in the discourse recently. The notion that you know, I live because you live, you live because I live, mm. and all that goes with that has become been becoming more and more um, foregrounded mm. in mm. ethical discussion. And it's that which leads back to the question of what's the nature of the body of Christ in the New Testament, what's the nature of mutuality. Mm. So this leads to my very last question. Um, you delivered a wonderful paper uh, here at the GNPT on ethics, empathy, and imagination. Um, and uh, my own doctoral work was in cognitive neuroscience and identity, and recently I've been working on uh, positive intergroup contact and the role of what you mentioned, uh, you know, affective and cognitive uh, notions of empathy, particularly between black and white South African Christians. But you raised a, a, a very, very challenging point, something around which I'm going to have to think a great deal, um, which is a particular view of empathy. I wonder if you can say a little more about the, the sort of kernel of the contribution you made today around empathy. My main point was that sometimes we're tempted to use the word empathy as a bit of a shortcut, yeah. ethically, as if all we really needed to do was understand the other, mm. and then all the problems would dissolve. Mm. Or all we really needed to do was put ourselves in another's shoes, and then we'd see what they felt like and we'd understand them and then it'd be all right. Mm. My objection is, well, I have a lot of objections, but that's stop of two. <laughs> One is, from a latter point, I will never literally occupy the place of another. Mm. And it's a great mistake to suppose I can, because when I imagine myself in the place of another, I imagine myself there. Mm. And that can mean I sort of appropriate their experience, I draw it to myself, mm. I turn it to another form of self-regard. Mm. So that would quite do. And also, the idea that simply knowing another's point of view dissolves the difference. Mm. And that's quite dangerous. So what I was arguing was real empathy is understanding that I can't understand the other. Mm. Understand that the other has a reality, a sort of density of their own, mm. in real sort of three-dimensionality. And because of that, I won't exhaust it in my imaginative efforts. But the imagination comes in, in the time I spend listening, absorbing, putting together what the other communicates with me, so that I can, I can continue the conversation, I can continue the learning process. Mm. And whether we're talking about the relation between individuals or between communities or ethnic groups or whatever, I think the same applies. Mm. The fatal thing is when, for example, I as a man say to a woman, oh, I understand your position, mm. or I feel your pain, mm. or when I as a white person say to a black person, of course I understand where you're coming from. Mm. There's a level which I might, if I'm intelligent and sympathetic enough, I might be able to say some of that, but I would say beware there will always be something you haven't mm. discovered. There will always be more you have to learn. And you have to recognize that the mysteriousness of the other is one of the ways in which you can go in this mm. situation. Mm. Now, I've also heard uh, some echoes in what you were saying about this uh, fundamental Christian commitment to deep solidarity, even in the midst of that mystery. So. I have a sense that you, you, you spoke uh, about this notion that we almost turn empathy into a utility. Yes. And uh, I have a sense that part of what we are needing to recapture, or that what I'm needing to recapture in my own Christian walk, is patience, deep solidarity, and a commitment that says, I'll journey with you, not because I may achieve anything that's good for me, but simply because we are bound to one another. Yes. The word accompaniment is one that I come back to again and again here, but we perhaps talk rather loosely sometimes about identifying the other, and what we might more practically think of is how we accompany one another. Mm. How, as you said, we walk together. Mm. Not because it's such an enriching and exciting experience for me, but because our well-being is bound up together. In keeping company, we discover what, what we might be to one another. Mm. Mm. That's, I think that's a, a practical, ethical goal that we should, we should be working at. Identification can so easily become a kind of sentimentality. Mm. And I think we have to pull that from that. Mm. 
Yeah, absolutely. Rowan, uh, you've had a very, very busy day, and I know you still have something ahead, so uh, I really want to say thanks so much for you. uh, your time to uh, spend a bit of time with uh, us on camera. And, uh, Great treat to be with you. <laughs> Great. So remember, it's not a lecture, just a thought. And uh, I'll post in the show notes uh, a number of links uh, to the work of Dr. Williams. So thanks for watching, and uh, we hope to be with you again soon. Great.